the hour. Uh, certain people need a uh, little introduction, and our next guest is one of them. F. William Ingdahl, of course, he's an award-winning geopolitical analyst, strategic risk consultant, author, professor, lecturer, what have you. His uh, website, WilliamEngdahl.com. You can get incredible insights from his writing, and uh, it's just really a pleasure to have him on again and talk to him uh, personally. Very neat. William, welcome back to the Power Hour. Well, I'm glad to be back with you. Well, we're we're over here in the United States on this continent, and you're there in Frankfurt, Germany, right in the middle of uh, uh, quite a storm with Angela Merkel getting elected and what have you. Now, what's going on in Spain? The independence being declared, then not declared. Uh, you know, where <laughs> where is that going? Uh, what's most important to you on the global scene? What is most important right now? I would say without hesitation the most important thing going on in the global scene is the coming together in a constructive and peaceful way of the nations or the countries of Eurasia, the Eurasian landmass led by Russia and China. And this is something so huge and so misunderstood in the United States. Uh, it's really a pity, but it goes directly to the fake news media, the mainstream media in the U.S. and all their adjuncts that take their marching orders from the Pentagon and the State Department and not from independent, honest journalism. What's going on is the building blocks of a new monetary not a monetary order to dominate the entire world like the Bretton Woods dollar system was intended to be, but a, a new alternative monetary ordering that would be backed by gold, will be backed by gold, in fact it is backed by gold, and the, bank, the uh, currencies of the Russian ruble and the Chinese yuan are the two currencies that have accumulated the largest gold reserves of any countries in the world in the last, I would say, 20, 30 years. So it's not only gold-backed currencies, it's not only a strong defense against the insanity of, of the military-industrial complex of, of Washington. Insanity, there's no kind word for it. It's psychosis pure from uh, Mad Dog Mattis and his whole Pentagon crew, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, uh, who says that uh, the greatest threat to world peace in 2025 is China. Well, that's the greatest threat to a global empire that will be a top-down Washington-led dictatorship is what he's talking about. And this is such stupidity when the world has this possibility to really come out of these uh, endless wars, these endless destroying of countries that uh, uh, Washington and their NGOs are, are so bent on, and actually building something beautiful, building uh, energy projects so that uh, people in the villages of, of uh, central Pakistan can have electricity, can have uh, heat and, and modern uh, uh, conveniences for the first time in their history. It's a, that's just one example. This, this Silk Road is, for those of your listeners who don't know it, it's, it's the Belt Road Initiative that was proposed by the Chinese president in Kazakhstan in 2014, and it's since then taken on a life of its own that is beyond anything I ever imagined when I first uh, wrote about it. And in summer of last, this last summer, in June, I spent uh, a couple of weeks touring China, visiting the key nodal points of the Silk Road, the port harbor uh, nodal points, the uh, rail, high-speed rail nodal points, and it's, it's just awesome. It's awesome. They, you know, 40 years ago, China was a third-world country heading south toward a fourth-world country, and in a mere three decades, with dedication, commitment, ingenuity, uh, tireless uh, effort, and so forth, China has built, I would say, the strongest economy in the world because the U.S. economy is smoke and mirrors. It's the government data is, is all faked. 
uh, I would say, the strongest economy. And in this Belt Road Initiative, they're expanding this to their neighbors, to Eurasia, to Central Asia, uh, cooperating with Russia to build rail infrastructure along the Trans-Siberian Railway. Russia, if you look at a, a map of the world, is the largest landmass of any country on the face of the earth. China is, I think, number two or number three, perhaps number three or number four. But uh, those two are contiguous. They, they meet at the border. And to connect them up with 1.3 billion Chinese people, 140-some million Russian people, the creative genius of, of Russian science and engineering, the uh, inexhaustible energy of the Chinese. And this is scaring the pants off of uh, Washington. This is, uh, so this is everything that's going on right now you can connect back to this. You, you brought up several key points. I want to go over all of them. Uh, China's kind of rebirth over the last 30, 40 years into a world economic superpower. Haven't, haven't they not done it on American money, basically us buying all their uh, exports? <laughs> yeah, but they did it on their work. <laughs> That's well, true, they, true, they but they did, did it with our money. I mean, I, the tears of Chinese labor. The American multinational corporations took that cheap labor and, uh, you know, walked away from any investment inside the U.S. economy. That wasn't the Chinese ordering the U.S. to do that. But the Chinese said, okay, if no, this is how no, you no. want to do it, we're going to use this open door to build up our own economy. And the way they did that was to say, okay, we'll do a joint venture with uh, Buick or General Motors, or we'll do a joint venture with Chrysler, and, you know, we'll assemble your cars and so forth. But we demand to uh, have some co-licensing where we can manufacture uh, key components here in, in China. And what they did, they sent their uh, uh, brightest uh, you know, students to American engineering universities. You know, in America, you go into a graduate school today, how many blue-blooded, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, or whatever description you want to give, American native-born are in the graduate schools of engineering and science. They're almost all Chinese or, or uh, Asian. Doesn't that tell you something? What have we done that we walked away from this? Uh, you know, America no longer is the leading building nation of the world. And the Chinese said, okay, this is not going to last forever, and we are going to prepare to be autonomous, to be self-sufficient. So I look at it very differently from the fact that we Americans, through our benevolent charity, uh, gave China all this. The Chinese earned that through hard work. It isn't the well, model. I, thought, well, I didn't mean it in that. Yeah. William, I didn't mean it, and that's, I didn't mean it like we gave it to China. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying either because of our lack of vision, of our, our laziness, of our corruption, we basically gave them the key to, to our brand new Ferrari and told them to go for a ride in it, and they said, oh, fine, then I will. That's what I well, mean. Well, they, they went for a ride, and then they uh, reversed the engineered the Ferrari and make a better Ferrari. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I yes, exactly. <laughs> Yes, that's a, that's a very good analogy. Yeah, uh, give me an example. Uh, United States has a few miles of genuine high-speed railway trains that go over 140 miles an hour. That's pretty slow by European standards. The Chinese began to see that high-speed rail connections through the vast landmass of China was vital to the connecting up their economy. Uh, so they began to import from Bombardier, from uh, Siemens in Germany, from whoever they felt uh, had a, a competent design. In fact, they took several. And then they determined to begin building, through their own state companies, they began building their own high-speed rail trains. They developed the technology for track that can take trains that go up to 400 kilometers an hour, that's uh, about 240 miles an hour in a rough calculation. Wow. wow. And these things, I went to Xi'an in, in June, and uh, the largest railway station in Asia was built about five years ago. 
And the only thing coming in and out of that railway station, smack in the middle of China, where the uh, original Silk Road uh, a thousand years ago or so uh, originated, and nothing but high-speed trains. It's fully automated. It's state-of-the-art, cutting-edge, uh, everything electronic, and uh, in English and Chinese, by the way, if anybody wants to go there. Uh, we got... But, but uh, this is kind of a vision. The Chinese think in terms of 100-year, 1,000-year cycles, not in terms of uh, three months uh, quarterly reports. And that's a very different thing. Yes. We have about a minute and a half before our first break. Um, you brought up education, you know, the, these uh, engineering degrees or whatever. What in the world has happened to our educational system? Looking back at it, you know, you live in Germany now. You're actually from America, but you live in Germany. Looking That's at right. it from afar, what conclusion can you come to? But but uh, are these people retarded or something? I mean, we have screwed this up so bad. What's your feeling in Europe looking back at this? I watched this with great pain. I did my university in one of the so-called elite universities back in the 60s. I began studying engineering, and I've watched the deterioration of, of American education. It's, it's parallel with the concept of globalization by the multinationals of our world. The concept of globalization is outsource everything. Turn turn Americans into a service economy. You know, they can they can uh, wheel people around in wheelchairs as the baby boomers start aging. And Hold that thought. Off. Hold that thought. We'll be right back, William. Will, F. William Engdahl. WilliamEngdahl.com. We'll be right back at this four-minute break. Stay tuned. Just now joining us, you've missed quite a bit. We've had an interview with Russ Dizdar about the uh, just Luciferian underground and what that what that looks like and means and the plans for that. We're talking to F. William Engdahl right now from WilliamEngdahl.com. Uh, just an acute uh, eye for detail and what it means on a macro micro level on these geopolitical situations specifically he opened the show or opened the interview with Russia and China coming together in a way that America can only dream of we we can't seem to get along with anybody but uh, these two superpowers supposedly are coming together and forming an economic uh, union that could change the world literally he's talking about a gold back currency we've seen recently venezuela we've seen turkey and iran uh, major economies throughout the world that are now moving away from dollar denominated transactions that plus this potential gold back currencies of the ruble and the yuan what does that mean for the united states economy specifically for the united states dollar william the dollar system that the United States or the Wall Street set up in 1944 in Bretton Woods was designed to have dollar control over the world economy. All the other currencies of, of the Bretton Woods countries were pegged to the U.S. dollar, not to gold. It wasn't a gold standard. They were pegged to the U.S. dollar, and at that moment, at that point in time, the Federal Reserve had more than 70% of all the world monetary gold. So nobody questioned that the dollar was as good as gold. It, uh, it was clear. And the world desperately needed American dollars as a hard currency to rebuild Europe, to rebuild Japan, to rebuild the war zones of Asia and so forth. So that went along fine until the end of the 60s when the rebuilt economies of France, Germany, Japan, and so forth began saying, hey, U.S. economy, U.S. government, you have inflation, you have huge deficits because of the Vietnam War and uh, deficit spending on the domestic economy. We don't trust the value of your dollar to be worth what it was in 1944. We want gold. We want something real for, for our uh, accumulated dollars from trade with the U.S., so they began claiming gold as they had the right to from the Federal Reserve until the point in August 71, Richard Nixon was advised by, among others, Paul Volcker, then at Treasury, that the gold reserves of Fort Knox, or wherever they hide them, 
we're about to be exhausted by foreign demand, central bank demand for, for U.S. gold, and that Nixon should tear up the Bretton Woods Treaty. Simply, might makes right. You tear it up to spit in the face of the other countries and say, what are you going to do about it? We're your nuclear umbrella, Europe. We're your nuclear umbrella, Charles de Gaulle in France. And the big bad Soviet bear is going to devour you unless you have our nuclear umbrella. So you have to accept our paper currency. And since that time, the dollar, after 1973, it was backed by this huge rise in oil prices, priced in dollars, made sure by Washington. Uh, that I made a detailed study of in my book, Century of War. It's uh, my best-selling book ever uh, about the Anglo-American oil politics. And then the dollar became more and more inflated. This is the great inflation of the 1970s and 80s. And you had recycling of petrodollars, all these gimmicks and so forth. But the real economy of the world was plagued by this dollar inflation. And that allowed, because foreign countries that export, that make things like China today or Japan or uh, Germany, certainly, they have little place to invest their surplus dollars at the end of the business year than to invest it in U.S. Treasury notes and Treasury paper bonds, AAA or almost AAA, and uh, to gain interest on that. There, there are very few places as, as big as the U.S. Treasury market to do that. So the debt of the U.S. is supported by China. At the same time, the U.S. is building a military confrontation with China using Chinese dollars in treasury bonds, if you can follow that. That's about what it is. Yeah, it seems insane. It, it seems insane. insane. Let me back up to what let me back up to what you said about gold or gold reserves. How many gold reserves how much gold reserve do we really have in the United States? We'll get the answer wow. after this three minute break with William Eggdahl. William Eggdahl Engdahl. What a what a what a mind. PowerHourNation.com. We'll be back. Three minutes. Let's get back to William. William, before the break, we talked about gold, the the coming currency. Russia and China, over the past you know five ten years, they've been sucking up gold like it's going out of style, yeah. and they've been storing it away. And that brings up the question about our reserves. How much gold do we actually have in reserve? Well, if we believe Mr. Manucha, who claims he went to Fort Knox and he looked with his own eyeballs, uh, everything looked fine. Uh, my gut feeling is the gold reserves of the Federal Reserve are virtually exhausted and have been for decades. And that's one reason the Fed works together with J.P. Morgan Chase and other uh, mega banks of Wall Street to use derivatives to manipulate the gold price uh, every time it gets dangerously high or starts a trend. Then they use derivatives and some cockamamie excuse to smash it down and uh, keep the price under control. And that's been going on for decades. Why would that be, why would that hurt them? If, if gold went, went, the price went crazy, what, why is that so dangerous? Well, if they don't have it, then other nations, let's look at who the world's leading gold producer is today. It's not South Africa. South Africa is down to number seven. They have huge economic investment problems in their gold mines and so the number one gold producer in terms of ounces per year is China. And interesting enough, the number two gold producer, number two, number three, depending on how you measure, is Russia. So if the price of gold soars, mm. the value of the reserve gold in those two central banks becomes awesome, becomes huge compared to other countries, and that will lead... Uh, to an abandonment of the dollar, essentially. How far away do you think we are to that point where the world just gives up on the dollar? I think we're not that far away. If you you mentioned earlier the 
uh, moves by Iran to not accept uh, dollars for, for its uh, oil and other exports, the move by Venezuela out of urgency because of the sanctions and other things that Washington is doing against the government there. And China and Russia are doing major trade in their own currencies and not in the dollar. And this trend is being picked up more and more. I would say it's not out of the question that uh, one day soon, and I'm talking about months, not years, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia will begin accepting Chinese yuan for Saudi oil. And when that happens, mama mia, all hell is going to break loose in the dollar world. Mm. Uh, recently, uh, in the Trump administration, early in the Trump administration, he went to Saudi Arabia, uh, sold a bunch of arms, you know, 400 million or whatever the number, you know, different reports had yeah. different numbers. I, and people were, people were, were praising that as a, a big purchase. I personally saw it not as a big purchase to help us. I saw it as Saudi Arabia dumping the, a chance to dump their dollars and get something real and tangible for it. Did you feel the same way, or did you have a different take? <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Uh, given the state of the art of the American military industry defense goods today, I would, I would say it's a waste of money. Uh, that's one reason the Saudis are interested in buying the S-400 Russian anti-missile uh, defense system, the same one that Turkey has just purchased, and the one that defends uh, Syrian airspace and defends, of course, Russia and China also. And uh, that anti-missile system is cutting edge compared to anything Raytheon produces, Patriot missiles and uh, the other systems that they're peddling on the world are, are well, they installed them in, in Japan years ago, several years ago, and little old Kim Il-yun fires two missiles over Japan and not a single response from this U.S. built air defense, you know, shooting the missiles down. So what, what kind of junk are they uh, being convinced to buy? No, quite seriously, the state of the U.S. military hardware is abominable. The corruption in the Pentagon is beyond belief. When the inspector general of the Pentagon says that there is $6.5 trillion of spending by the U.S. Army uh, in a period of years, but $6.5 trillion is not pocket change, that cannot be accounted for, that there's no paper audit trail possible Wow. That means either wow. you, have, you have a corruption on a scale that is just beyond belief. This is the deep state. The, the two pillars of deep state power since 1945 have been the dollar as world reserve currencies, for reasons I said earlier. Then the world is forced to take dollars and therefore forced to buy U.S. Treasury bonds with their trade dollars. And that allows Washington to run endless deficits to finance all the wars they want. They don't have to worry about selling it to the American citizen. They sell it to the Chinese who feel they have little other choice. Well, now they're developing the other choice. The Russians have begun since the sanctions in 2014, and Iran and, and uh, so forth. So the other pillar, of course, is U.S. military might. But the corruption in the Pentagon has created an armed forces, and this is no disrepute on, on the men and women of the armed forces. They're the suckers in this game. But uh, because they have to work with this defective hardware around the world, uh, let's leave aside the question of whether these are uh, worthy missions that they're sent to in Syria and all these other places. But uh, the hardware is, is, is junk. It's junk. Uh, of course, there's you, some kill power, but, but compared with what the Russians on a military budget, one-tenth of what the Pentagon spends, or maybe even uh, one-twentieth, they have developed cutting-edge technologies because they're clever. They don't need to have the endless corruption of, of cost-overrun contracts and so forth. They know that their survival depends on being able to defend their territory, and 
what they have done in the Syrian war scared the pants off, off of the higher levels of the Pentagon. I, I know this for a fact. When they blinded in, in the Black Sea, when a, a U.S. military ship began floating toward Crimea after 2014, a Russian military ship flew over that ship, and that ship had serious armaments on board, and blinded the entire communications of that ship, completely blinded it. And then they started uh, doing dives on the ship, and the sailors on board literally were scared to death. When they got on back on port in Romania, <laughs> a number of them filed for leaving the service. They were so terrified. So the Russians have technologies that are, are built on a shoestring budget because they're clever people. I, I've been to Russia many, many times and talked with uh, a wide variety of Russians and scientists and others, and they're very clever. <laughs> we used to be clever, but we forgot how to educate our, uh, our uh, children and uh, opted for gimmicks and let it be done. I want to get back to what you're saying, the deep state corruption and the money being sucked out, really just raped out of the American public. I mean, it's a strong word, but this is a strong thing we're doing. I want to get back to what you said earlier. You went, you went right where I wanted to go on North Korea. North Korea has obviously been a hotbed of discussion and of possibilities one way or another. I'm going to ask you the same thing that I've asked a lot of people on the show. Is China controlling North Korea, or are they acting independent? That's the first question. China is not controlling North Korea. They're furious with Kim, but they're also furious with Washington because every time there's a new government in South Korea that is oriented toward reconciliation with the North and ending this war tension. And the minute that new government came in and began making overtures via China, via Russia, who has a, uh, a vital role in, in terms of North Korea, South Korea. Uh, don't forget that Russia borders North Korea, as does China. So the moment that began to happen, you had these ridiculous uh, gestures coming out of Washington, provocations and so forth, and then the UN General Assembly speech of, of Trump, where he pledges to uh, completely destroy North Korea. I mean, this is not a good way to calm things down and come to, uh, you know, peaceful resolution of these questions. The what is it that, L L William, what is it that North Korea is upset about, about America? Because we see them, basically it's like somebody coming into your yard and waving a gun around with the threats that he just continually makes. I mean, at some point you have to do something. Why are they so upset? And it but, uh, well, let me just say it this way, that North Korea knows that they're not going to, uh, they're in uh, no condition to... Uh, nuclear uh, destroy the United States. Maybe they can land a missile or two on, on Guam, but that's not going to destroy the United States. They, the speeches are made to a large extent for domestic consumption, I think. And uh, the other is that uh, Trump's tweets and, and Pentagon actions and so forth are intended to create that kind of provocation intended to keep it hotted up. And uh, as long as that happens, we're going to have this back and forth. Uh, I met with a former ambassador to Beijing when I was uh, a journalist in Davos World uh, Economic Forum back uh, about uh, 17 years ago. And he told me, he said, if North Korea didn't exist, Washington would have to create it. Now, this was 17 years ago. And he's now uh, deceased, but this was uh, uh, James Lilly, the CIA uh, station chief in Beijing and uh, the architect of the Tiananmen Square uh, color revolution is what it was without the color uh, in the early stages of that process. And he said that if it didn't exist, we would have to create it because we need an excuse at the end of the Cold War to keep the 7th Fleet in the Sea of Japan. 
to control Japan, mm. to control South Korea, and uh, to control China. Uh, Joel Skousen was on, I don't know, a month or so ago. He talked about North Korea. The New World Order sees North Korea as a trigger event to have a nuclear strike on American soil. Uh, he referenced the PD, PD-60 that uh, under, uh, I think it was Clinton, I believe Clinton, excuse me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's Clinton, PD-60, that we no longer fire uh, our nuclear weapons on warning that we have to wait and have the code, and that we are very vulnerable for to absorb a first strike. Do you? What's your feeling there? I really doubt that, to be honest. Uh, well, due respect, I don't think this North Korea. I think the North Korea game is a game. Uh, it's aimed at the U.S. Congress voting a huge increase in Pentagon military budget for years to come. And it's aimed not at North Korea, it's aimed at China. So the, the more you claim there's a military threat from North Korea, the more you convince South Korea to come closer to NATO and take the THAAD uh, anti-missile defense system that the new government was very hesitant about, and very reluctant to take, and now they have decided to accept it. And keep South Korea and Japan on the reservation, so to speak. Is well, war with, yeah, I've heard many people, I've heard many people say this, William, the way things are shaping up, is war, is war with China inevitable? No. And okay, you don't see a coming class, okay. No, no, this That's is good. all, this is all gaming. This is all gaming. The United States military is in no position to wage war against China, particularly when China is in military cooperation closer and closer with Russia. They just can't pull it off. They, so, you know, all, all the, uh, it's an electronic military. The U.S. military today is electronic. And that can be blinded by uh, technologies that the Russians and Chinese have already. That can be completely blinded, and then you're sitting there like a stupid duck. So this isn't going to happen. <laughs> no, I'm serious. This isn't going to happen. But what is happening is the world is getting all hot and bothered. The aim of this is to sabotage the coming together of Eurasia, as I described in the beginning of the program, through the... Belt Road Initiative, the new economic Silk Road that China and Russia are cooperating on building, crisscrossing all of Eurasia, building ports in Gwadar and in, in, uh, the uh, Arabian Sea, uh, right across from Iran and, and the Persian Gulf, to bring oil direct from the Persian Gulf by pipeline through Pakistan into China and avoiding the Malacca Straits where the U.S. Navy can block everything if they want. We have, uh, we have one segment left with William Engdahl, WilliamEngdahl.com. He's got a new book coming out called Manifest Destiny. We're going to get into a little bit about that. Um, just great to be with you, William. We'll uh, stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, three-minute break. William Engdahl, right back. He has a new book coming out called Manifest Destiny. I'll ask him about that uh, uh, here in just a second. Finishing up, kind of wrapping up, as I'm listening to you, and I, I love to hear your analysis, I see a country, the United States, the, the power, the might, the ingenuity has been absolutely robbed. The financial fortitude has been robbed and sucked out of our country, either through corruption, laziness, whatever. It's been sucked out. It's been pulled to other areas where other countries uh, have ingenuity, too. Other countries have a creative, creativity also, and they see opportunity. And what used to be the world superpower, the United States, has lost that edge and is in danger of losing, really, their whole position for of any kind of viability as far as a leader. Um, I, to me... As that happens, whether it's by corruption, right, wrong, or indifferent, there's going to be some conflict. That's me. Just, just what I see. Um, 
let me get your thoughts on that comment. The conflict is everywhere around us. If you look look at Syria, that is a conflict uh, initiated by the United States, by NATO, but that's the U.S., by the CIA, by uh, uh, various special forces. The Arab Spring, that's conflict all over the Arab oil world back in 2010, 2011. The conflict around the South China Sea, the South China Sea military bases of China are a response to the Obama Asia pivot, military pivot toward China. Uh, rightly so, China said, well, uh, what are we doing that we want uh, this whole encirclement of us militarily? And then the coup d'etat in the Ukraine, if people aren't aware of the history of what happened in 2014 in Kiev in, in the uh, uh, protests there against the government. That was a military coup d'etat carried out by Blackwater, uh, the daughter company or the successor company of Blackwater agents on the ground together with, with the CIA forces. And they had sharpshooters in the buildings shooting innocent protesters and then shooting police mm. so that everybody went into panic and, and February 2014 the president fled, the elected president Yanukovych his crime was that he opted for a much better economic deal from Russia to join the Eurasian Economic Union of Russia and Kazakhstan and Belarus rather than a minimal association with the European Union which would mean Nothing uh, positive for, for Ukraine and simply open the economy up for looting by Western companies. And the, so the, the coup d'etat there, there was a neocon operation, Victoria Newland and so forth, even research all of this on the uh, open sources. But uh, all of these wars everywhere, it's, it's a sign of weakness, not a sign of strength, in my view. And that's because the world is moving on from these constant wars. We're sick and tired of it. The American people are too, but they don't have a chance. You, we, we were given a Donald Trump who uh, is a demagogue pure, but he's showtime. He's, he's showtime. And the deep state, he's not mopping up the deep state. He is the deep state. <laughs> That's, if you want to know what the deep state looks like, look in the eyes of Donald Trump and you'll see it. It's not you, a let me quickly, we have, we have about a minute. Do you see value him pulling out of the Paris Treaty? Do you see value of that for the American economy? I mean, there are some things that he's done here to help Amer be America-centric. What do you well, feel the, there? The economy of the U.S. is based on fossil fuels much more. Uh, I am not a subscriber to the global warming uh, nonsense. I don't think it's, it's scientifically what's going on. I think there's solar activities. That, they fake the data. Yes. But the computer models are fake. By the well, William, we got to go. Okay. We got 10 seconds. I want to tell you thank you, thank you. When your new book, Manifest Destiny, comes out, you've got to come on. Okay? Cool. I'd be happy to. Oh, fantastic. WilliamEngdahl.com. Thank you, William.